All right, I'd like to bring in Professor David Thornburn here. He's the co-group leader of Brain and Mitochondrial Research at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. He's also a professorial fellow at University of Sydney. Welcome to Nightlife, David. Hi, Indira. It's actually University of Melbourne. I better correct that or I'll get in trouble. Oh, yeah, sorry, University of <laughs> Melbourne. I actually misread it. Um, no, no problem. All right. So, David, you've been working on mitochondrial disease for years now. How serious a condition is it, in your view? Uh, oh, it's a very serious condition. I, I've worked on mitochondrial disorders for 30 years. Um, and my lab, I mean, I, I'm primarily a, research, a researcher, but we've provided a diagnostic referral service um, and have been referred most Australian children suspected of these disorders. And so we've diagnosed over 600 children with mitochondrial disease. Um, and most of those children have, have not made it to, to adulthood. So, you know, these um, can be very severe disorders. The most well, the most severe disorders we don't see because the embryo doesn't develop um, through the full gestation. But the, very, the severe end that we see is kids um, in the first days of life um, who may have multi-organ failure or severe disease or um, quite often kids can be okay for a few months and then have an episode. Um, uh, Lindell mentioned Lee disease, which is the most common form of mitochondrial disease in children. And, and that scenario is that kids are typically healthy for maybe six months or so. They have a viral illness um, and they deteriorate, might have unusual breathing, um, uh, funny eye movements, um, seizures. They might recover from that episode, but it's typically a progressive downhill course. So, so there are these early childhood disorders. And as Lindell said, um, there's a very wide range of, of symptoms, um, an age of onset and severity. So, so some of these disorders are, are milder. So, David, does that mean that if you have these defects in your mitochondria that uh, you will become sick or, or are there instances where people actually don't become sick? Yeah, it's a complicated question, um, partly because there's, um, there's really 350 different genetic forms of mitochondrial disease that we know about. And, and so many of them have the same type of genetics as every other form of inherited disease, um, so, so-called nuclear diseases. There's about 6,000 different rare um, inherited diseases we know of. So about half the time, it's one of those regular diseases where one or one or two of the, the copies from, from mum and from dad are affected. And about half the time, it's in the mitochondrial DNA. Um, and so for some of those specific changes, um, we know that uh, everyone in the family will carry the mutation, but only some will be affected. Um, mm. That's sort of at the milder end. Um, generally for these diseases, we can pretty much predict whether someone will be affected based on how much of their mitochondrial DNA is affected. Okay. So why, David, is mitochondrial donation such a good option for people with mito disease who want to have children? You know, the challenge is that um, so mitochondrial DNA genetics is a bit more complicated than, than regular um, inherited diseases. So with other genetic diseases, um, you know, it's really mum's giving you one copy of a particular gene, dad's giving you the other copy. And so when we think about if one or two is not working, it's really zero, one or two are working. Mm. In mitochondrial DNA, there's actually thousands of copies in every cell. Um, and so um, that means that uh, it could vary from, you know, not just zero, one or two, but from 1%, 10%, 50%, 90%. And so um, it's a little bit harder to work out what is definitively an affected cell or an affected individual based on the testing. Um, and so, you know, the genetics is more complicated. For women, um, most women um, carrying a mitochondrial disease mutation, uh, a mitochondrial DNA mutation, will have a mixture of eggs that some may have none of the mutation, some may have a moderate amount that may or may not cause symptoms, oh, right. some may have a very high amount. So it is much more complicated than regular genetics. Right, okay. And as uh, we were chatting to Lyndall about, the term uh, three parent babies gets thrown around a lot when talking about this because of the genetic material from three individuals, even though the third individual is only a, a fraction amount. Obviously, yeah. it makes a great headline, David, but is it an accurate way of describing what's going on here, three parent babies? Uh, well, I don't think so. And, and certainly, you know, the, the families and the, the patient advocacy groups don't think that's an appropriate term. I, I guess I've used the term before as of others that if you're going to use that terminology, 
um, it's perhaps better to say a 2.02 person baby <laughs> um, because the amount, you know, the number of genes in the mitochondrial DNA is 37 compared to 20,000 nuclear genes from mum and 20,000 nuclear genes from dad. So it's a tiny proportion. And the other thing is that, you know, every egg um, uh, has a unique combination of, of your mum's genes and every sperm has a unique combination. So, so those are, uh, you know, your, the genes that you get from your mum and your dad um, are completely unique. Your mitochondrial DNA is, is, if you're healthy, is the same in you as it is in all of your maternal relatives. So it doesn't have that same individuality um, as the nuclear genes. And it's not something that determines your, you know, your hair or eye color or skin color or your height. Um, it's really about um, you know, ensuring that you have enough energy um, for, for you to develop normally. Um, and so you know, it can impact certainly on your, your height and your weight if you're unhealthy, but um, you know, it's not determining those individual characteristics that we think of. Um, from the rest of our genes. Mm. For our Sunday science chat tonight, we're looking at uh, mitochondrial donation and mitochondrial disease. My guest is Professor David Thorburn. He's a co-group leader of brain and mitochondrial research at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. David, as Lyndall mentioned before, uh, there are some reasons why people do find this technology controversial. Do you think their concerns are justified? I think it's very reasonable to discuss the concerns um, and you know with any new technology um, you have to think about the safety and efficacy and the potential risks um, and and at some stage you have to make a decision is is that technology ready to introduce do you think that the the likely risks are outweighed by the potential benefits um, and then you know for this for this particular um, approach mitochondrial donation clearly um, some people have have strong views around um, uh, you know, well, some people have strong views around any form of assisted reproductive therapy. Um, and there has been discussion with mitochondrial donation about, um, you know, terms like um, germline gene editing or germline genetic modification. And is it that? And, and I guess the relevant thing for mitochondrial donation is that in, in the UK, it went through a series of four scientific reviews by the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, um, successively reviewing the data on safety and efficacy had a Nuffield Bioethics Council review. It had extensive community consultation. And then we've essentially repeated that process um, in Australia via initially the Senate inquiry Linda referred to in 2018. That led to the government asking for, um, asking the Australian National Health and Medical Research Council, the NHMRC, um, to put together an expert committee to review specific questions that arose from that Senate committee um, and to engage in public consultation uh, and that process went through. There was then another process um, around a proposed approach um, that the government uh, suggested to introducing this. And now there's finally been this um, Senate uh, Community uh, References Legislation Committee um, reviewing the actual legislation. So it's been through a lot and there's been very extensive public um, engagement mm. on, on the issues. And how long has all of that process taken so far, David? Um, so in Australia... Well, so maybe it's better to start with. In the UK, um, basically, it was a, a more than 10-year process going from um, oh. enabling the legislation to do the initial safety experiments, safety and efficacy experiments on human embryos, um, uh, and then through to um, legislation being enacted, the final um, safety um, data being generated, developing a licensing process for the site that was doing it, developing a licensing process for the couples who wanted to access it. Um, and so, as Lyndall said, um, legislation in the UK passed in 2015 um, and the first couples were able to be enrolled in 2017. So in Australia, around about 2016, 2017, the Mito Foundation, which is um, a really an amazing patient advocacy group um, uh, in Australia, and I should say a disclaimer, I am actually on their board, um, but it's really driven um, by um, the, the members who, who have either been... Um, uh, had a child with mitochondrial disease or had other family members affected. So they've, they've driven this process of engaging with government um, and, um, and that was what resulted in the, the Senate inquiry. So it's really been about a, a five-year process in Australia um, to get this to this stage where legislation has been um, drawn up. Right, okay. 
And the case in Mexico that Lyndall mentioned where the, this US-based team went there because of the lack of regulations and then they use these te techniques to help a mother uh, with mito disease give birth to a healthy child. Now, how do you think this particular episode impacts on the way a, the public perceives mitochondrial replacement? Um, yeah, well, I think mostly negatively, and I think it was a terrible abuse of, uh, of process, basically, that, um, uh, you know, this, um, this group deliberately evaded any regulatory oversight. Um, and, and, you know, um, the couple were actually from Jordan, the group who had performed the procedure were from the US, and, and as Linda said, they went to Mexico to evade the rules. Um, they then proposed doing this in the US and, and was shut down pretty much straight away from, from further work. So the, the couple um, who, um, uh, who had an apparently healthy baby, there was no process put in place for the follow-up of that baby. The testing suggested that there was very, very little carryover of mitochondrial DNA from um, the birth mother. So that it appeared that the technique worked reasonably well, but it was just a terrible process. The, the only reassuring thing is that it appeared to work well despite um, all the, de the deficiencies in the way they performed this mm. um, procedure, which is a complete contrast to what's gone on in the UK, where it's been this extensive engagement um, with the community, um, the science community, uh, and the ethicists um, to set up this process that's restricted only to women at high risk for having a, a child with severe disease and in a, a highly regulated process. So do you think that it set back the advocacy for this procedure here in Australia? Um, I don't know if it really set it back. I mean, I think in, in one sense, it's a contrast of, you know, this is what could happen if, um, you know, it, it's sort of the medical tourism concern of, um, uh, you know, if we think this is an appropriate um, process to introduce, um, then it's better to do it here um, with high quality science and a high quality medical system with an appropriate regulatory environment rather than have people um, try to seek it out in some other jurisdiction um, where there is no such oversight or, or regulation. Mm. And David, are there any potential uses of mitochondrial replacement in other situations? Um, so I guess there's two things one could think about, and, and, and one is for, for other genetic diseases. There, there is really no role for mitochondrial donation in regular genetic diseases um, affecting the nucleus. It has, it has no utility there. So it's, it's only, you know, its goal is to replace the mitochondrial DNA, which is separate from our 20,000 nuclear genes. So it has no utility for prevention of other genetic diseases. Um, the other condition um, which there has been discussion around and which appears to have been trialed in some, in some places is whether this technique could be used um, to improve reproductive outcomes in, in women who've had, say, recurrent implantation failure or have advanced maternal age. There's really very little evidence that that um, works in process, in, in th that that process would work in practice. Um, and the experiments that have been done in that area um, have been done in, um, in places, again, with no real um, uh, legislation um, governing them and haven't been reported in detail. There is a conference abstract, um, the group that was sort of shut down from doing this in the US, because I think it's fair to say that um, the, uh, the patient, the family with mitochondrial DNA disease was really their loss leader for setting this up as an IVF technique. They started the company a month or so later to offer it as an IVF technique. They weren't allowed to do that in the US. They formed a joint venture with the Ukrainian company um, who have done this apparently um, on uh, 30 couples with a very low success rate. So um, to me, there's not a lot of evidence that this would work for, for IVF. There's always some uncertainty about risk in introducing a new procedure. Um, so I think all the submissions from the scientific and ethical community that I'm aware of to the, the various processes have suggested that the, um, you, know, you can justify that the potential benefits um, outweigh the potential risks in the case of a, um, a woman at risk of mitochondrial DNA disease, but that equation is, is not there for, um, for uh, an IVF method. All right. Uh, Lyndall, if I can bring you back into the conversation, we've mentioned the British process and the, and the British example. If we basically replicated that and went through the same process, would, would that be sufficient or should we maybe change some of the experiences from the British example? 
Uh, I think what the UK did incredibly well was the public consultation around this. So um, there was a lot of debate leading up to this legislation being passed, both in the press and more formal debate um, among the public. There was a very long community engagement process. And I think here in Australia, we, we really have replicated that quite well. And I, I would say one of the reasons that was such a success is that both the scientists and these incredible families, um, very brave families, often talking about really painful issues, did uh, just an amazing job of communicating the need for this type of science. And and, you know, we we speak to scientists every day involved in controversial research and the media can be really quite a scary place. Mm -hmm. um, they're often worried about being misquoted and seeing sensationalist headlines. And there is a real temptation if you're working in a controversial area to run as far away from the media as you can get. But but these scientists and families went to science festivals and church meetings and patient groups and politicians. And they, they really talked about this this. Um, you know, process far and wide in really simple terms, um, and and it was really for that reason that um, that this was pushed through. You know, if if the scientists hadn't been out there really arguing the case and the families hadn't been out there arguing the case, we really wouldn't have seen um, this this passed. And that that I think is a fantastic example for any scientist working in a controversial area to follow. I think there are probably some some details around the exact legislation that we that we might um, want to rethink here. I don't know, David probably has a few more details on that. Yes, well, I wanted to ask you, David, I mean, we've just talked generally about the legislation, but can you help us with the specifics? What actual changes do need to be introduced to make this procedure available? Um, well, it's primarily around changing two acts of parliament from 2002, which are basically laws around banning cloning. Um, as some of the methods used um, have, uh, you know, overlap with cloning. It's clearly not cloning. Cloning is generating an identical individual. Um, uh, you know, any child born from mitochondrial donation will have exactly as much variation from their parents as, as any other child. Um, so there's the cloning law, and then there's um, one for research on, um, on human embryos. So they clearly ban um, the generation of, embry of an embryo that has um, DNA from three individuals, including mitochondrial DNA. So they have to be changed. Um, I think there's a small reg some small changes in the Gene Technology Regulation Act as well. Um, and so Maeve's law has proposed those changes. And then in, in terms of comparison to the UK, I think it's probably more in the implementation um, than, than in the legislation, if you like, um, that there'll be a, um, a few things that are, are likely to differ and David, if this law uh, and these changes go through, what happens then? I mean, how soon could we be helping couples with this procedure? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, so um, it, it, it won't be immediate, certainly. So the, the proposed model is for five different types of licences that could be issued. So preclinical research and clinical research um, and training uh, um, licences. And, and so... Um, Basically, the, the way this is designed is that um, uh, initially mitochondrial donation would be offered as a clinical trial um, where um, it, it, the, the, the wording around it is that one organisation, which is probably going to be a collaboration between um, a medical research institute, perhaps, and hospital um, pathology labs and the IVF or assisted reproduction providers, um, will... Um, have to demonstrate that they can, you know, the, the, the IVF people will have to demonstrate that they have an embryologist who can achieve the sort of outcomes that are being achieved in the UK, which require, um, you know, basically um, no more than about 2% of the mother's mitochondrial DNA being carried, carried over um, into the, the fertilised egg. Um, so they have to demonstrate their expertise um, and then they'll have to be licensed as a centre to provide it. Um, developing that clinical pathway, uh, and then there'll be licensing in some way or, of an, or another to ensure that the, um, the couples are at high risk for, for mitochondrial DNA disease and appropriate to this um, process. So that requires setting up an oversight committee, um, and it appears that that will be the NHMRC Embryo Research Licensing Committee. So 
I think it, it's um, it's likely to be one to two years at a minimum, I think, before this can actually be offered in, um, you know, in practice um, in the form of a clinical trial. And, uh, and the legislation um, flags the potential that in the future that can be changed from a clinical trial um, to clinical practice by an act of parliament, which would then require any of the states doing it um, pretty much to change um, their mirror legislation around this topic. So, you know, there's certainly still hurdles um, to jump through before this can be offered. Okay. Well, it's going to be interesting to see at least uh, what sort of legal changes uh, potentially may happen. Thank you so much to both of you for, for all that information and, and uh, clarifying the details of this very fascinating piece of technology. Thank you very much, Lyndall Byford and David Thornburn. Thanks, Adira. Uh, they've been with us for our Sunday Science Chat, uh, helping us understand mitochondrial donation and mitochondrial diseases.